Jeremiah says at the end, you know, be perfected in him. And I think it's so important for us to recognize, and we've said this before, and we've heard it from the pulpit or whatever, but, um, you know, I don't believe that there, there's ever a moment where uh, there's some sort of magic moment where, where we go from being not perfect to perfect. Uh, but that perfection, this, this walk towards God, um, where he becomes more and more and more part of us is a process that we go through if we choose. Um, if we allow ourselves to be perfected in him, if we're willing to walk that walk, if we're willing to uh, allow the things that God would uh, have us do to work what he wants us to work with in our lives, uh, we become more like him. And that is, that, that is the whole thing. You know, as the scripture says, you know, when he comes, that we may be like him. Uh, that his image, good morning, uh, that his image is in our countenance. Um, that we see him in us. Um, in this whole, uh, this whole chapter is about that. Um, is allow yourself to be perfected um, in him. And so we read previously about uh, how important it is to have Faith, hope, and charity, and that these things work together to accomplish this work. Um, and uh, we've read previously about, and we'll, we'll review that one quick, uh, how important the gifts of the Spirit are. Uh, these things that um, the Lord gives us as part of our walk with Him and this worship with Him to allow us to accomplish His work. And so uh, we'll finish that chapter today. We'll, we'll um, discuss those good words and see how much time is left. Um, if someone wants to be my timekeeper today, uh, 10.30. I should turn on my... I should turn this on because people upstairs... <laughs> if somebody wants to remind me... Because we do have a song service today. So welcome. <clears throat> Corey, would you mind offering a word of prayer this morning? Sure. God, we pray to you in the name of Jesus, and thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for sending your word. Thank you for the mercy we find in, uh, in your word through Jesus. We pray, Father, that uh, our minds might be open today, and uh, we can understand these great words that you've given us. That you, uh, we thank you, Lord, that you've given us an authority in, uh, of scripture, uh, so we can understand you and your ways for <coughs> Thank you, Lord, for these people here, and pray your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, thank you. All right, okay, so um, these first few slides are just review because I think we've spent plenty of time on this topic. Um, but I did want to emphasize what Moroni is emphasizing here. Um, that there's a lot of time given in this chapter to discussing spiritual <coughs> gifts. <coughs> spiritual gifts. And Moroni mentions these spiritual gifts. Um, teaching the word of knowledge, having great faith, gifts of healing, working mighty miracles, prophesying, the beholding of angels, the beholding of ministering spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and he says all these gifts come by the Spirit of Christ, and they can come to every man severally according as he will. And so we discussed how um, these gifts don't come to us because we want them. Um, these gifts don't come to us because of our own will or things that we would accomplish, but these gifts come to those as the Lord desires, and they come to those as we exhibit faith. And so we just tried to look at one example a couple of weeks ago um, yeah, about the disciples and how the disciples, these men that walked with Christ, these 12 apostles, they were sent out without having ever seen, uh, without having ever done anything miraculous of themselves. Um, and how God said, I'm going to give you authority to do these things, but they had never actually done them before. So they actually had to go out and try to do what he said. And then as they did that, 
those gifts were made manifest. And um, I, I just thought it was a, a great opportunity to remind us that we don't always know how we'll accomplish the things that God has asked us to do. We don't always know how we're going to be able to minister to people. Um, but we, we step out in faith and we simply try to spread this message of Christ. And he does whatever he wants to do in that moment. Um, whether it's giving us words to say, things to think, things to, uh, things to do, um, whether it's exhibiting any of these gifts, uh, those come out as we do, try to do the things that the Lord has asked us to do. So um, I just encourage us, to, hopefully we believe those words, we have faith in him, and when he says, you can do whatever is expedient in me, whatever I ask you to do, you'll be able to do. I hope that we believe those words. So those are important. Um, and so Moroni finishes that idea off by saying, you can't be saved in the kingdom of God if you have not faith, neither if you have no hope. And um, despair comes because of iniquity. And I thought that was an interesting idea. Um, and that's the last words we read together. Um, when we find despair, the lack of hope comes when we don't have that hope of Christ in us. Um, and so um, it, is, it, it really only is the gospel of Christ that gives us hope in this life. Um, and I think that's just so interesting. So we're going to move on from there, um, and we're going to read um, uh, Moroni 10, 18 to 26. Um, and he's going to talk a little bit about um, what happens if these things are not in your midst, right? So I think that there are some interesting ideas there. So say you need these things, right? You need to have faith, hope, and charity, but what if they are not? What, what happens when they disappear, right? Um, anybody willing to start us off reading today, 18 to 26? Corey did? Okay. And now I speak unto all the ends of the earth, that if the day cometh that the power and gifts of God shall be done away among you, it shall be because of unbelief. And woe unto the, be unto the children of men, if this be the case. For there shall be none that doeth good among you, no, not one. For if there be one among you that doeth good, he shall work by the power and gifts of God. And woe unto them which shall do these things, uh, do these things away, away and die, for they shall die in their sins, and they cannot be saved in the kingdom of God. And I speak it according to the words of Christ, and I lie not. And I exhort you to remember these things, for the time speedily cometh that ye shall know that I lie not. For ye shall see me at the bar of God, and the Lord God will say unto you, Did I not declare my words unto you, which were written by this man, like as one crying from the dead? Yea, even as one speaking out of the dust. I declare these things unto the fulfilling of the prophecies, and behold, they shall proceed forth out of the mouth of the everlasting God, and his word shall hiss forth from generation to generation. And God shall show unto you that that which I have written is true. So he's, he's closing out his thought there. Um, I need to do a word study on the word hiss. Just sort of like as I, as I read that, because that's only used a few times in Scripture. Um, Isaiah uses that word. Need to, maybe for next time we'll do, figure out how that word is really meant to be used. Um, so, what thoughts do you have about that? Moroni is very sure, <laughs> he's very certain about what he's saying there. Because we, we, he, he said already that he, Christ ministered to him. Um, and so he has no doubt about what he is saying. Right. So what is he trying to say? Or even what? What is one thing he's trying to say? Don't be bashful. <laughs> um, it's not about what we want or our 
our thoughts or our, our ways. It's about Jesus. You know, we are not the the way, the truth, and the life, but He is. And so if you're going to do away with faith and hope and your belief in Him, it's not going to go well for you. Is that understated enough? <laughs> Well, even in society, yeah. you know, if all these gifts are not prevalent or not present, you know, it's because of unbelief. And so if you as a nation, if you as a culture, if you as a society quit believing, you're in trouble. You're in, you're in deep water. Um, so we can't allow our faith to waver. We can't allow our faith to falter. I mean, we can because we're human, mm -hmm. but we, we shouldn't. We don't. Uh -huh. And uh, we got to endure to the end, like it says. You know, mm -hmm. you got to have faith. You got to mm -hmm. have belief in me. And and you look at society nowadays, and there seems to be no need for God. There seems to be a smaller and smaller number that believe in Jesus Christ you know and, and like I said before these are these are not fables that somebody's made up you know we like Peter said you know we were there we saw him mm -hmm. we know he is we were eyewitnesses to what happened so I don't know just kind of what yeah. Trace was saying huh? yeah <laughs> I'm sort of intrigued by the or comforted or thought provoked by if there's just one person left, uh -huh. it'll still, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> you know. I, I mean, it's kind of encouraging as it dwindles that that. But if there's even just one left, God will still. He pretty much was just the one left. He was the one left. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yes. So he knows that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh -huh. It's a living testament. I thought that was important too. Um, both those, all three of those things are important. Um, so it's, it's important for you guys to share. Um, we are not dependent on anybody else's faith, right? Um, and so I, 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 I'm encouraged by that idea too, that even if anybody around us is not a believer, right, that d does not mean that the Lord is not going to work through anybody that is seeking for him, right? Anybody that is exhibiting faith, right? So, um, sort of like, um, what's the city that God was going to destroy? And what's that? I don't, not great on Old Testament stories. And just give me one person. Yeah, uh, is that, mm -hmm. oh, that, that one anyway? Yeah. <laughs> give me one person. One person. Yeah, yeah that one. Um, and so the Lord is going to work through anybody that is showing faith on him and, and has hope on him, whether it's, you know, the whole society after he, after Christ was there or whoever's left, right? Um, we read in, um, in Jesus' words um, uh, his prophecy about sort of like end times and how the saints are few. We've talked about that, you know. The Church of Christ is scattered and it's small, it's few. Um, but that doesn't mean there's not light within the life or the relationship of those that are still seeking him. So, you know, we're not diminished by anyone else's lack of faith. Now we are, we are, we are strengthened by each other. Right? But he's going to work good through anybody that's seeking after him. I think that's really important. Um, previously in what we read last week when Moroni is talking about these gifts of the spirit remember he said these gifts are eternal they are part of who God is and they will never go away right except through unbelief and so it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy right when I stop believing I stop seeking and when I stop seeking I stop finding Who here can say they're a witness to a gift, one of these gifts of the Spirit? 
who, who, who can say they've seen a gift of the Spirit? I mean, raise your hand if you've seen a gift of the Spirit. Right? Okay. All right. We're, we're witnesses to that, that these gifts are true, that they come from God. Right? Um, what other thoughts about that? So, stop me if you want to talk. Uh, it's important for us to say today, right, um, that these gifts that are mentioned by Moroni, starting at chapter 10 that I read, um, the gifts of healing and miracles and hold, beholding of angels and ministering spirits and tongues, interpretation of tongues and prophecy, these gifts of the Spirit are available today, Right? And they work by faith. So Moroni is encouraging anyone who will read these words, continue to walk in faith. Continue to exercise faith in doing those things and following those words that I've asked you to do. Right? And I will be with you in that. So uh, no, we don't have to worry about what anybody else is doing. Right? We want them to be, we want them to know Christ, but they, that can't limit how God can work with us. I think one thing that I got out towards, got out of it towards the end of it, was he was talking about, um, you know, if these, these, um, if you don't, if you do away with them and they die, they die in their sins. And, you know, that he, he lies not and blah, blah, blah. And he goes on to say that, you know, there'll come a time when you'll be standing before the bar of God. And, you know, it's like, um, did I not declare my words to you which were written by this man? Like as one crying from the dust. It's like, I think we're going to be not be able to stand there and say we weren't forewarned. Mm -hmm. So... Never really thought about that one before because usually yeah. I'm focusing on the other. The, we're not going to see the gifts if we've lost our faith. And uh -huh. but you know he's also telling us. Oh, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Um, that you know, here's here's a here's an admonition. You know, mm -hmm. you need to heed this because there's going to come a time you can't say you weren't forewarned. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, that's very true. Yeah, you know, because he has knowledge of these things, he's saying them out of knowledge, and he's letting us know, you know, these words here, they're, these are words of, these are God's words, not my words, they're the words of life, right? And you've been told them, you can choose to believe them or not, but I'm telling you they're true, right? Sort of how, sort of how he says it, the myth, the myth words, yeah. Well, that's important, too, because there are other scriptures that say the same thing from the apostles yes. you know, and ministers all the way through the, the true church. And that was, you've got to believe, and, and you can choose not to, however, you have consequences. And he is a witness, and he joins in that witness of others, and in the mouths of two or three witnesses are all things proven out. Yeah, yeah. Same words, yeah. all over the place. Oh, Same right. ideas, all over the place. Yeah. So remember that this is a man who's having to finish off a record and speak through that inspiration of the of the spirit, and then put them away and have faith that they're going to do what God has said they're going to do. Um, so this is his last plea. And my, on my Book of Mormon, it says pathetic finale. I don't like the word pathetic on there. Um, I'm not sure where that came from. I think this is a really hopeful. I thought the same thing. I think this is a really hopeful finale, really hopeful final, final words. That may be another word to research to see what really means. Yeah. <laughs> well, those are all people that editors put that on there at some point. Speaking of words, so in verse 22, it says, The time speedily cometh. And then he says, you're going to see me at the bar of God. And, you know, give or take, 
It's been 2,000 years since, you, I mean, 1,800 years roughly since these words were written. I don't think in anyone's book that's speedily as we think of speedily. So I, I got thinking about that word since Chuck mentioned definition of words. And I, I know this isn't the point of it, it's kind of a minor point, but this is used several times in the Book of Mormon. And I, and I looked it up, I used AI and some other things and said, hey, in the Hebrew, did they ever use this word to mean something else? And honestly, I, I think most of the words in English are what they are. I don't think we have to go and kind of delve into original meanings. I, I think it's explained pretty clearly. But, but I, I wondered, does this word speedily mean something else? And long story short, it also means it's guaranteed or it's assured. Like, so if I inserted that word for the time is guaranteed that you're going to know I lie not, or, or it's, it's assured that you're going to know. And so where this, this is important is he's saying, you, you're going to be guaranteed we're going to meet at God's bar. But even more important, I think, for our understanding as a church people is the end of 1 Nephi 7. And I, I'll just paraphrase but that. That word is used five different times in, in the 1 Nephi 7 and 2 Nephi 12 where Nephi is writing. And he says these things are speedily coming. Yeah. But I think the early saints may not have understood that because it said, well, Satan is going to be bound and, and it's going to happen speedily and, and Israel is going to be gathered and it's going to happen speedily. And I know, I believe anyhow, there were a lot of saints thinking, hey, Israel's just coming right down behind us in the wagon tracks. You know, they're going to be gathering in with us because it says speedily and that isn't what it meant. Mm -hmm. But... I, anyhow, I won't go on about it, but I just think that's an important word to understand in context where it's used. Well, that's why the early saints moved to independence, because they, they thought for sure that Zion was coming. Exactly. I mean, they were Everyone. convinced that Zion was coming. But, I mean, again, you also look years down the road, you know, now obviously I wasn't around during World War II, but what I heard is saints also thought Zion was coming, because there would be wars and rumors of war, and, you know, at the time, it's the greatest war to hit the United or hit the world. So this has to be. So it. this has to be it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, and so, I mean, even in our lifetimes, you know, Y two K, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan. And, now the Middle East. Yeah, the Middle East, one hundred percent. But it's like that word soon. <laughs> and and speedily here, if if you read it in this context. Mm -hmm. The time speedily cometh that ye, yes. ye, that's an individual, that ye shall know. And who here, at the age they are right now, has thought, how fast has life passed me by? It's like that. That's true. Speedily isn't necessarily from the time he wrote it, but from the time we from read our it. Personal. Yeah, it's an individual. Our personal. He's speaking to us individually. Yes, so our lives are short. Um, that brings so, up the idea of the time to repent is now, don't yeah, put it off. Yeah, right. Because yeah. you don't know what the future may be. Exactly. I think the invitation that comes to scriptures is always now because God knows our nature, right? And it's so easy to put off things to another day, right? Um, the present is the only time that we have. Um, and so, you know, that that moment where well, well we're going to leave this earth at some point and it's going to maybe come faster than we want it to mm -hmm. and when we stand before God we'll know the truth of all things yeah. he, he says yeah. just like Christ told the thief on the cross uh, this day you will be with me in paradise Moroni says I'm going to meet with him in paradise yes. That's he, he's, and we all have that yeah yeah. Each one of us have that opportunity. All of us will have that moment. Yeah. So, I just hope I didn't overdo that discussion. I just feel like it's important for us to have hope in these words that the scriptures say, right? That the things of God... Um, the way he works, and that's a part of what Latter-day Saints means, right? That's what a part of what this church was, this idea this church was established on is God works today like he's always worked. He, would, he does today or is willing today, 
or able to do today what he's always done in any age of any scripture that we read about, right? Um, he still works. He always works. This is perpetual. This is always. Um, and Moroni wants us to not lose faith in that, not lose hope in a God that's living. Right? So we shouldn't lose hope or faith in a God in knowing that God is living right now. Right? And, you know, let's, we want to continue to come every, every Sunday and pray expectantly, expecting to receive from him. All right, these are the final words um, of the Book of Mormon. Um, we'll read 27 to 31. Uh, we, the, we, we read these a lot um, from the pulpit because they're words of hope, words of belief, words of faith. Um, Vic, would you read them? Would you read these last few verses for us with the, with the mic? share just a little something before we do sure. as it says come a couple of times come into Christ and um, I remember when I first started coming here Ken was a uh, um, pastor and uh, the thing throughout I think most of the time that he's always been pastor has been come and the spirit bore witness to me of, of um, the importance of that and it bore it very deeply and, and uh, it always means a lot to me and I feel like the Spirit bears witness continually every time I hear and see that, of that calling, come unto Christ. Mm-hmm. And again, I would exhort you that you would come unto Christ and lay hold upon every good gift and touch not the evil gift nor the unclean thing. And awake and arise from the dust, O Jerusalem. Yea, put on thy beautiful garments, O daughter of Zion. And strengthen thy stakes and enlarge thy borders forever, that thou mayest no more be confounded. That the covenants of the eternal Father, which he hath made unto thee, O house of Israel, may be fulfilled. Yea, come unto Christ, be perfected in him. Deny yourselves all ungodliness. And if you deny yourselves all ungodliness and with God with all your might, mind, and strength, then his grace is sufficient for you that by his grace you may be perfect, perfect in Christ. And if by his grace of God ye are perfect in Christ, you can in no wise deny the power of God. And again, if you by the grace of God are perfect in Christ, and you deny not his power, then are you sanctified in Christ by the grace of God, through the shedding of the blood of Christ, which is the covenant of the Father unto the remission of your sins, that you become holy, without spot. And now I bid unto all farewell. I soon go to rest in the paradise of God until my spirit and body again shall reunite and I am brought forth triumphant through the air to meet you before the pleasing bar of the great Jehovah, the eternal judge of both quick and dead. Amen. It's hard to find um, better places than the Book of Mormon where somebody just lays out the purpose of what we're about. Just lays out with, with no extras, right, what it is that the Lord is trying to do for us. Um, so, just wonderful words. Wonderful words to end this invitation. Um, but as Vic said, He's saying, come unto Christ, right? Come to him, right? You're called, you're chosen, you're invited. His hands are out, reached out for you. Come unto him. Um, uh, It also discusses a response, right? What is the response to this invitation of Christ? Um, What stands out to you? What, What words do you like? What ideas do you like as we finish this off? It's hard to make anything more clear than that, but what do you what do you like out of that? I like one thing that it 
give us a different definition of how grace works, I guess to use that word, than what you hear out on the street among Christians. And I'm generalizing, but it seems that people will say, well, you know, Jesus died, there's nothing you have to do, it's grace. You know, just kind of go your way. But I don't think that's the message. At least that's not this message. It's like, you know, there is a work we have to do to deny ourselves of ungodliness. And if we do this, it says, if we love God completely, then we become worthy of His grace. It says, then is His grace sufficient for you. And, and if we do that process of coming to Christ, like Vic said, and, and becoming perfected in Him, like you said, then it says, then you're sanctified by the grace of God in verse 30. Then Jesus' blood is applied. And so there, it's like, it's not so much that it's conditional, but it's like there's a responsibility on our part to do something. And I think that's what the world doesn't tell us. When we die, right, that bap- that's why that baptism, that symbolism of baptism is so important and powerful because, you know, we don't just, we don't, when, when we die, we say, you know, we're baptized, we agree, right, to, to die to our old self and to rise a new person. We, we agree to let his sins wash us away, but we also agree to follow him and take on his name. Um, and so, you know, in a very simple way, he's saying, here's what you do. You seek to deny yourselves of those things that separate yourself from me, right? That's what ungodliness is, right? The things, I'm mean, not on. The things that you know that are not that are uh, opposite of my plan. Those are the things that you should seek to be done with, to know me. If you know they're ungodly and choose them anyway, right? That's sin. So, did you want to say something, Vic? Yeah, uh, I just like to touch on sanctifying just a. a in a class, uh, a lot of talking can be done about it, but just in my understanding and in a nutshell, it's, well, it's becoming perfect, but it's also in that process, it's the unification of your mind and heart. And your mind normally knows what's right and wrong and, and knows to do what is right, what is good to keep the law. So why do we sin? Because of the lying and craftiness and deceitfulness of of the devil or the evil spirit uh, that would speak to the desires of our heart, we have a war between ourselves. Well, I know I shouldn't do this, but mm-hmm. I want to do it because of the lying and deceitfulness. <clears throat> so that that sanctification is when your heart desires what your mind knows is right. Mm-hmm. And it's by the grace of God only that this can happen. It, I don't believe it's something that we can just will ourselves to be sanctified. Right. It is by His grace. Mm-hmm. But it is that process of, of you're not warring between what you desire, which would be different than what you know to do. You're, you're one. Our heart changes. Yeah. To Him. Right. So that we want the things... That he wants. Yeah. That's an interesting... I've never thought about that idea before. But it's a, it's a good way to think about that. Yeah, and, and good again, thing to remember. Again, with the grace part, the Christians talk about grace, and you know, like Corey said, that's all you got to do is because grace saves you. But it also says, and that's why we have to be careful as much as we can to be seeking for the truth to... Uh, to know what it's really saying and putting a lot of things together sometimes because you can take one thing out and, and make it mean possibly what you want or you think it means something because you're not aware of the other. And so that grace is, is after we have grace in our faith, we want to keep his commandments. So it's not because of works that we keep his commandments that we work any, uh, uh, obtain anything because we can't. It's by His grace that we're able to keep these things. But our works show to other Christians, to those that aren't, that we have accepted Christ and that we're trying to, mm-hmm. to keep His commandments and do the right thing in as much as we can or, or no, depending on where we're at 
in your walk of faith. Mm -hmm. I think the thing for me that really talks, kind of ties into all that a bit, the, and love God with all your might, mind and strength, you can in no wise deny the power of God. How, I mean, how could you if you loved him with everything you had? Yeah. I, yeah, the whole purpose is, and I'll have you go next, the, the, his whole purpose is that because we know him, we become a different creature, mm -hmm. right? that this part of knowing Christ causes us to change, right? Away from our carnal self towards his, toward, towards his image, towards his countenance. And if we don't allow this grace and this power, this love to change our hearts and we stay in that sinful state, you know, we've already been our own judges, right? That's what the Book of Mormon has said. We're our own judges. We have, just, we have chosen that. Um, and so he wants to get us out of our old, old the out of the old man, into a new man, um, so that we're, so that like you, you both have said, you know that our heart wants him. That's the whole goal. We want to be with him in eternity. Yeah, I just um, you know if you look at the Book of Mormon as a whole, you know how was it that some of these prophets, some of these great leaders ended? You know what were the final words? You know, Moroni here is saying, you know, uh, you know, the love of God, grace. Um, nowhere in there does it say what's going to happen in the future. You know, it was, you know, the love of God and grace. Um, you know, Lehi was basically telling his sons what's going to happen, but there was contention among them. Um, Nephi died fighting the Lamanites. You know, so there really wasn't those last words like we have here. King Benjamin gave a message of hope. Um, Alma the Younger took his sons and said, sin no more. Um, and at that time, Moroni gave up being the leader of the army and kind of went off and died kind of the same time Alma did. Um, Nephi, the son of Helaman, I mean, he dies in kind of, I guess if you want to say, a perfect world, at least at the time, um, with the Nephites. And it wasn't here until Mormon and Moroni where they're saying the love of God. I guess what I'm trying to get to is they kept it like super simple, you know, hope, the love of God. And that's where sometimes I feel like we always try to predict and we always make things harder than what it needs to be and you know God's message is so simple but sometimes I feel like we try to overanalyze it and we try to dig deeper and deeper when we don't need to. Who else did that? Huh? <laughs> really? Israelites, right? I don't know, I mean, I don't know. So yeah, I, 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 I mean, I, these yeah. words are just, you know, we just have said these are like perfect words, there's a reason we read these words. Because it's a simple, it's a simple message for anybody. You know, you can't. You know, the hardest thing when I was in the military was trying to explain at the time why is it that we have the Book of Mormon? Because you couldn't, you couldn't say, "Well, you're Mormon." No, I'm not Mormon. Uh, I'm, I'm Restoration. Well, what's that? And then, okay, well, you know RLDS. No, I don't. Okay, well, do you know the Mormons? Yeah. So you're Mormon. No, I'm Mormon. Um, so, I, I mean, but here, I have to say the Book of Mormon. I mean, that, that, I mean, that could be anybody that, hey, God loves you. You are forgiven. I mean, that's a message for anybody. That's just not a message for us. That's a message for this whole world. Think about it. If we took that message and the world lived by that, think about how better the world would be. You know, we wouldn't be fighting in the Middle East right now. The world needs... The world needs Jesus. There's not a whole lot more better you can say about that. Yeah. Uh, Patty. I, I kind of like that. This is just a real, a real plain, ordinary thing. Mm -hmm. But he says, arise and, and he addresses it to the women. Arise and put on your beautiful garments, O daughters of Zion. Because, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we've always been into fashion. But I don't think he's talking about our 
garments we normally think of. Yeah. You know? Uh -huh. It's like I'm thinking of the scripture that talks about the breastplate of righteousness. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, putting on faithfulness and truthfulness and kindness and, mm -hmm. you know, charity and faithfulness. And, yeah. Your best self. Huh? Your best self. Yeah. Mm -hmm. even, even that word picture is, <laughs> even that word picture, though, speaks to this message, right? Cast off your dirty garments, right? And put on garments of righteousness, right? And walk forth, right? Come to me. Uh, put on my garments. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's straight out of Isaiah, right? Which has been... Um, which is just already a you know, prophecy for the future. Um, I like that too. I like what it said about stakes. We don't have stakes anymore, do we? Except on the grill. Well, he's talking about the tabernacle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's talking about the tabernacle, and this is part of the prophecy we've read is, you know, this tent, right, which is the house of Israel. It has to get really big. This tent is for everybody. The tent of the covenant, right? So you're going to have to pull those stakes out, move them back, make this tent bigger, because this covenant is it, it's for the whole for the whole world, not just for the house of Israel. Larger stakes, yeah. You know, I in speaking of that, I I remember reading a little book one time. It was talking about the prayer of Jabez, um, and the one little part that I really got out of it was. You know, it's, the prayer of Jabez occurs in the scriptures where there's a lot of genealogy. You know, so-and-so begat so-and-so and so-and-so begat so-and-so. And all of a sudden there's this, just this little paragraph. And it talks about the prayer of Jabez. And the author, my understanding is, goes into um, what he really was asking God. Because in, in the prayer of Jabez, he asked God to enlarge his borders. And I think sometimes we so we get so focused on ourselves and our little world, you know, that we're living in here, our our part of the little world, mm -hmm. that we we don't see that big picture. You know, we don't. Maybe there's, maybe we need to enlarge our stakes to the point that we are talking about a global. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Renaissance of, you know, faith and that those last day things. You know, because we, it's not just Zion and our church here, you know. I mean, it's, it's got to enlarge to go to the whole world. Yeah. And I think sometimes, yeah. that's what he's talking about, and, you know, strengthen your stakes and enlarge your borders. Yeah, it's, you know, that tabernacle's got to get really big. <laughs> well, that's a good thinking for all of us. We get sort of siloed in our own world, our own church, our own, you know, we've got to think a little bigger than that. Yeah. For everybody, yeah, it's a bigger story, like Corey says. Um, any other thoughts there? I, I liked um, at the very end, you know, he, he makes a comment that is consistent with what Alma says to his son when he's Alma, his son's asking, What happens when I die? Um, so he mentions this until my spirit and body shall again reunite. So I'm going to rest in paradise, I'm going to be spirit until the day of judgment, right? So that goes back to that conversation that. Alma has with a son about what happens to us when we die. Um, you know, we, we rest in spirit, right? Um, and then there is this day of judgment where our bodies and souls are reunited. And at that moment, right, the, the, the desire, the God's desire is our body and our souls, right? Are we want him, right? That's the whole, are, would we, do we want to live with him? Or is our heart in a place where we want to live with him in eternity, because if, if we don't want that, right, the scriptures say, you know, we would be miserable in eternity with him. We, if we don't want righteousness, we would not want to be with him in eternity. So um, that just goes back to that whole discussion, which is bigger than any of us. Um, but it does remind us here, here's what happens when we die. There's a space between the time that we die, and our bodies and souls are reunited. Anybody else? Any closing words? Well, I, I like that it's hopeful. You know, the pleasing bar of the great Jehovah, the eternal judge. You know, mm -hmm. it's not going to be like this scary thing. You know, it's, it's, 
pleasing, hopefully. I guess. Um, maybe yeah. No, that's helpful. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like what you said about, you know, sometimes we get kind of stuck in our own little world and we, you know, we don't look at other things. Um, nowhere in here did Moroni ever specify a certain people. Um, you know, he said, you know, if ye have by the grace of God are perfect in Christ and deny not his power, then are ye sanctified in Christ by the grace of God? I mean, you know, so that, I mean, that's a message for everybody. Um, not just the Mormons or the Restoration or the RLDS or whoever it may be or the Israelites. Like, this is a message for, for all of us. Um, and I think if there's anything we could do as a people is to, to get that message out. Um, and, you know, let people know. Because, again, you know, the world today, you know, it's, it's, oh, the Book of Mormon is full of lies. Oh, like, if you actually sat down and read it and had an open mind, you would see it in such a different way. But, again, we all take what it was. I mean, again, Missouri, Missourians were afraid that the Mormons were coming in to take things, so they automatically put down the Book of Mormon and put down the people and basically kicked them out. Um, and again, over time, that just continues, continues, continues. And we all know what happened in Utah. So, I mean, I think if, if we do anything, it's get that message out. You know, it's by His grace. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Next question. No, we should never be ashamed of what this, this book represents, because it's the gospel, right? We're just recommending Christ, right? Hopefully we can talk about the judgment bar of Christ being pleasing, right? Brian? Yes? I was going to say it, but if you look at the last verse of Enos, that's the other side of what is being talked about here. He says, I look forward to the day when this my spirit body will come together and I'll be before the pleasing bar and I'll get to see him. He says, come to me, I have a place for you. So that's that's the other version, that's the other side of that glass that you're talking about. He just says the same thing? Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah. So I like, Josh, I love that. I love that you talked about finales. There are a lot of finales in the Book of Mormon because there are so many writers of the Book of Mormon and each of them is going to close off their ministry or sign off their ministry in a different way, but, they sound, but they're going to have the same message. Because if what are you going to do? What are your last words going to be about Christ? Right? If you had to say one thing about Christ, what would you say? This is your last words about him in this text, right? So what are you going to say about him? Well, you're going to say what you believe about him and his power to change lives. Anybody who remembers Jim Robbins um, stood up to speak one time I can't remember his exact words, but he said, if you want to know what was important to the man, read his last words. And that's what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. It's like read the end of the book first. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, I know some have suggested that, you know, reading, you know, Moroni chapter 10, verse 4 about the, the promise that is in the Book of Mormon. You know, reading that first. Uh -huh, yeah. Um, but, no, no, I mean, again, I mean, Alma, Alma turned it over to a new generation. He turned it over to his son. Moroni turned the army over to his son, and they both went away um, and passed away, just like Moroni did here. It was the last, you know, of, of a really great generation of Nephites, and um, an unfortunate, unfortunate end. Who knows? what could have could have been if they would have stayed righteous. But I mean that's the I mean that's the story. I mean I mean I, our what what our church would be today um, if if it was that. You know, because I always I always heard growing up that the fifties were the great times. You know, we had all of this stuff and we had, you know, a storehouse, a hospital, a, a co op, you know, all this farmland and and, you know, what, what could have been. Because all I've grown up my entire life is contention. So, um, but, but again, if you, if you sit there and, 
you know, you listen to some of the preachers. I mean, Arthur Oakley got up in the 50s during conference when they were arguing about changing the name of the church back then. And he says, are we not the church of Jesus Christ? I mean, he said that in front of conference where everybody was. Um, you know, like I said, you know, if we just keep that, if we keep it simple, I mean, that was our first, that was our first camp, you know. Um, keep it simple, you know, that's the last part. Small, 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 yeah. small and yeah. So, I mean, that's what we got. Small and simple. Yeah. <laughs> keep, it, keep it simple. That's, <laughs> a, that's a better, better yes. way of putting it. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's just never remember, you know, it's easy for us to get distracted on whatever, right? Contention, arguing about doctrine, um, politics, what we think is going to happen in the future, uh, what prophecy means, all those things, right? Um, Moroni is reminding us here, right? Here's what's important. It's your relationship with Christ. Remember to seek after him. And when you do that, and you are doing what you can, right, he's going to lead you unto perfection, right? He's going to lead your heart to know him. And as you seek to exercise faith in him, the things that he does, right, the Lord's work will be done in your midst, right? He'll be done around you and in you. Um, so just those are good words to keep us grounded. So because we're going to stop um, I'm just going to introduce what we'll be doing in the next few weeks, um, and then um, we'll come back next time and we'll start reviewing. I was looking back at my slides, um, and um, 2021 is when we started reading the Book of Mormon in the fall um, of 2021. Wow. Yeah, so we've had this class in this with this focus since then. So we're going to phrase this at not a test, okay? Are you ready to share the hope that is within you? Okay? So um, I believe that it is important to know what the Word says so that we can share the Word. Or in other words, the Word needs to be written in our hearts. We need to have within us a belief and an understanding of what God has said so that we can share that easily with people we come in contact with, Right? So I'm going to share a few um, big takeaways as questions, um, and I'll have you do some, some writing on your own and then talking to um, each other, um, and we're going to have one piece of paper after a few weeks that we can have some big ideas about what we can say about the gospel according to the Book of Mormon. Okay? So that you have those and have in, in your own words um, what we can say, right? What you believe, what the word says. Um, so that it's because I just believe we should never, ever, ever um, be afraid to say what we believe. Um, so. <laughs> so the first question that you can think about is, According to the Book of Mormon, what is the purpose of the Book of Mormon? So, that's your first job. You can think about that. Well, that's, yeah, we'll start with that one. Okay, Rex. Josh mentioned the 50s. Um, the greatest growth of our church from the 1900s to today took place in the latter part of the 50s, in the, in the 1950s. And that's when Israel A said, each one win one. And, and it worked. And that's what we need to do. And we're here. This, what we're talking about is the biggest promise that we can have. It's a huge promise. And so many people, family members, acquaintances, friends, they don't know it. They turn a deaf ear. Uh, each one wins. Thank you for your conversations to share today. We'll go sing.